The Open Door Baptist Podcast features the insightful preaching and teaching of our senior pastor, Jason Murphy. It also comprises of special messages from a number of guest speakers throughout the year. The purpose of this podcast is to be a witness in our community, to encourage others to grow in their relationship with God through the preaching and teaching of His Word, and to serve others in the name of Jesus Christ. Chapter 3, please. Esther chapter 3. And Brother Andrew's going to read for us. And let me preface as you're turning to Esther 3. What I'm going to do is have him read verses 13 through 15. And then have him read Esther chapter number 4. And really to lay the foundation for the message. It's not a standard thing, especially on a Sunday morning. Where I would, uh, you know, take uh, that big of a chunk of scripture. But I think it's imperative for you to fully understand and uh, grasp what we're going to look at today as we consider this thought. So Esther chapter 3, turn there if you would, look at verse 13, and then we're going to read through verse 15 and then chapter 4, and then I'm going to have Brother Andrew, he's going to open us up in a word of prayer. All right, Brother Andrew, thank you. All right, please follow along with me if you will. Esther chapter 3, starting in verse 13. And the letters were sent by posts into all the king's provinces to destroy to kill and to cause to perish all Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day, even upon the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month Adar, and to take spoil of them for a prey. The copy of the writing for a commandment to be given in every province was published unto all people, that they should be ready against that day. The posts went out, being hastened by the king's commandment, and the decree was given in Shushan, the palace. And the king and Haman sat down to drink. But the city Shushan was perplexed. When Mordecai perceived all that was done, Mordecai rent his clothes and put on sackcloth with ashes and went out into the midst of the city and cried with a loud and a bitter cry and came even before the king's gate, for none might enter into the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And in every province, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, there was great mourning among the Jews and fasting and weeping and wailing and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. So Esther's maids and her chamberlains came and told it her. Then was the queen exceedingly grieved, and she sent raiment to clothe Mordecai, and to take away his sackcloth from him, but he received it not. Then called Esther for Hatash, one of the king's chamberlains, whom he had appointed to attend upon her, and gave him a commandment to Mordecai, to know what it was and why it was. So Hatash went forth to Mordecai unto the street of the city, which was before the king's gate. And Mordecai told him of all that had happened unto him and of the sum of the money that Haman had promised to pay to the king's treasuries for the Jews to destroy them. Also he gave him the copy of the writing of the decree that was given at Shushan to destroy them, to show it unto Esther and to declare it unto her and to charge her that she should go in unto the king to make supplication unto him and to make request before him for her people. And Hatash came and told Esther the words of Mordecai. Again, Esther spake unto Hatash and gave him commandment unto Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces do know that that whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come unto the king into the inner court who is not called, there is one law of his to put him to death, except such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter, that he may live. But I have not been called to come in unto the king these thirty days. And they told to Mordecai Esther's words. Then Mordecai commanded to answer answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Then Esther bade them return Mordecai this answer. Go, gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan, and fast ye for me, and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise, and so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther had commanded him. And let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for this time that we can gather, and uh, we thank you for the blessings we've already received thus far in the day, for the good fellowship, for the good uh, time we've had in Sunday school already, 
and uh, no doubt, Lord, the, the blessings received in the early 945 service. Now we meet here again, Lord, to open the word. And though we've had a good time, we've had uh, a warm song service, and the music has been wonderful. But at this time, Lord, if we turn our ears from the truth of the word of God, then it's all been for naught. If your Holy Spirit is not with us here today as we meet, Lord, it's all for naught. So we pray that you'd be with us to guide our hearts and to guide our ears, that we may receive the message. If there's someone who is here who does not know of their eternal future, I pray that they would walk out these doors with that assurance, that they would know without a shadow of doubt before they leave that they could have a home in heaven. And for those who do know, Lord, they need their hearts warmed and comforted today and admonished. Would you be with us today, Lord, as we accept the word and be with Pastor as he preaches it? We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, Brother Andrew. Appreciate that and uh, him reading that text. And as I mentioned, I don't normally will read a big chunk of scripture like that on a Sunday morning especially, but I really want to lay the foundation for this message. I'm, I'm conscious of the fact there's some people here that are already familiar with the story, and there's some that may not be, and I think it'd be, uh, I'd be remiss to not help you to have some good foundation as we look at this thought today of praying for such a time as this. And that's what we're going to look at today, and this is a tremendous picture of what praying and fasting can do for a person in their life uh, if it's done in a way um, that no doubt is pleasing to the Lord. So I titled this message, well, it was three weeks ago we did Tried for such a time as this. Last week, we, or yeah, last week we looked at faithful, being faithful for such a time as this. And now we're looking at praying for such a time as this. And I believe it's important that we do not neglect prayer. We don't neglect it. I think that sometimes we take for granted. I, I, I would be far stretched to believe there's anybody in here that doesn't say, I believe in prayer. I would assume that everybody believes in prayer. This passage, what we just read, shows us the power of prayer. Now I'll say this, real prayer is not easy. Real prayer. Um, there's one thing to sit down and if somebody's you know, it's the food, rub-a-dub-dub, thanks for the grub. You know, that's not real prayer. I'm talking about getting alone with God, entering into your closet, if you will, and communing with God, bringing your prayers, your supplications, your request unto your heavenly Father. And so it's one of the most spiritual things a Christian will ever do is spend real time in prayer. And I'm of the belief that many times, listen carefully, we do not avail in certain areas that maybe we would desire to because we have failed to even ask. Keep in mind, the Bible does say, and I know it's simple and it may seem redundant, but you have not because you ask not. And so you have to keep in mind that God has recorded in his word really a prescription for us, uh, laid out uh, what he would have us to do. There, uh, uh, prayer is needed. Prayer is needed. Prayer is needed for our country, for our leaders, uh, for our church, may I say for, for your family, for yourself individually. Uh, prayer is needed for Christians to stand up and let their light shine for such a time as this. It's needed. And I, I'm not, I am not one that is ready to resign myself and say, well, you know, we're in the Laodicean period, bless God, and you know, the church is going to hell in a handbasket, and everybody, you know, I'm not going to give up. I want to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So you just stick by the stuff. And prayer is one of those things so often neglected. But we're going to talk about it today. I've never done it on a Sunday morning. Normally it's a Thursday night or a Sunday night. But we're going to look at it today. And I think if you listen attentively, that you're going to get... Uh, helped here today. Brother, Arns, or, uh, Brother Steelman, you can turn me down just a little, if you could, just a hair, please. So praying, praying for such a time as this. During a minister's prayer one Sunday, there was a loud whistle from one of the back pews, and little Gary's mother was horrified, and so she pinched her little boy Gary and asked, and, and just tried to get him to stop whistling, and asked him after church, said, Gary, whatever made you do such a thing? And Gary answered soberly, I asked God to teach me to whistle. And he just then did. Now, we get a kick out of that, but I really believe that you have to admit the little boy believed in prayer. And I wonder sometimes if we believe it as much as we say we do. 
as much as we say we do. I'll give you an example. Uh, If somebody tells you, if you do 100 crunches a day, 100 sit-ups, you're gonna get a six pack, kind of like that right there, okay? Well, it was a six pack and then it went to four and two and it's kind of now like a keg. But, uh, but you know what I'm saying? You, you, you believe the sit-ups, somebody says whether it's juicing or whether it's something uh, that's gonna help you, uh, has medicinal value or whether it's something that's gonna help you on a physical, whatever, we practice uh, what we preach. And if we say we believe in prayer, then we will know if we really believe in prayer if we actually practice prayer. And I mean real prayer. There's a difference. I understand we're to pray without ceasing. We're to constantly stay in communion with God. But I also am of the persuasion there's something to be said with somebody that is willing to, and I give the analogy because Jesus did, get in their closet. It doesn't have to be a closet, but it can be a closet. Get in your closet and prayer and pray and get alone with God. Prayer with fasting is one of the most powerful, but perhaps one of the least spiritual tools that uh, in the life of the average, uh, least used spiritual tools in the life of the average Christian. Fasting is going without food voluntarily in order to give yourself more attentively to prayer and to God. It's important to note, and I believe this to be true, that, that fasting transcends dispensations. I I think that you don't hear it talked about much, maybe as much as it should, but fasting transcends dispensations, and I'll give you an example just real quick. The Old Testament, if you study your Old Testament, it's full of of fasting. You see that in the Old Testament. Um, Then you have it in the New Testament. You have in the book of Acts, may I even say in the latter part of the book of Acts, Paul is bringing out fasting as as a principle there and something to be done. And then lastly, even in Corinthians, Paul says, if you're having marital problems, he says that you ought to give yourself to prayer and fasting. Lest Satan tempt you for your incontinency. And so prayer transcends and, and, and fasting specifically transcends dispensations. Now you can fast by skipping one meal and spending that time in prayer. You can fast an entire day or in in some maybe uh, serious cases, three days or what have you. Can I say this please, Don't, don't miss this. When it comes from a medical standpoint, I would just tell you if you have medical issues or whether it's diabetes or some kind of health issue, really don't listen. You talk, at least talk to a doctor and get some advice on some things before you go out and say, I'm gonna do a 40 day fast. Um, you know, Moses did, so I'm gonna do it as well. And, um, and I'm visiting you in the hospital or something. So just use your discretion and, and, uh, and pray and, and seek the Lord and uh, wisdom in that area. So notice, if you would, in chapter 4 in Esther, uh, Esther's response to Haman's plot to have all the Jews in the Persian Empire murdered. So keep in mind, and I know we read a lengthy passage of Scripture. Let me say this. This is what's going on. God has always, or, excuse me, the devil has always hated the Jews. Yeah. Always. So here's a plot. Haman's just the, 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 he's a puppet on a string. And who's behind that is the devil. And so what you have here is Mordecai, or excuse me, Haman. He's got this plot. And the plot is to kill all the Jews. There's 127 provinces that the king is over. And uh, from India to Ethiopia. And he has got a plot and that's to destroy all the Jews. And so that comes to fruition uh, where we see it in chapter four unveiling before our very eyes. Now look at chapter four and look at verse number 16. This is the response that Esther gave once she found out from Mordecai the plot. Look at 16. Go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan and fast ye for me and neither eat nor what? Three days, night or day. So specifically, she's asking her friends to pray. Why? Now follow me. Esther's about to go before the king unannounced. And going before the king unannounced means that she's putting her life on the line because she could be killed just like that, going against the law. Notice she asks, if you look at the verse closely, to go beyond their ordinary type of fast. 
She says, abstain from food and drink. Look in the middle of verse 16. It says food and drink. Normal fasting is abstaining from food. She also requests three specific days. She wants, I want three days. A normal fast for a Jew would have been from sundown one day to sun up the next day. That'd be a normal fast for a Jew. She was calling really for an extraordinary fast for a specifically difficult case. Now, you'll see how this applies to you and I in a minute. You may be sitting there thinking, okay, I'm not gonna go before the king, and I don't know how this applies to me. You'll see it in just a minute. Remember, the Persian king, was an, he, was a, he was an authoritarian ruler, and if you went before him unannounced, you're putting your life on the line, and she knew that, and so she decided to risk her life. Why? Because she wanted to stand in the gap for her people. She wanted a three-day period of fasting and prayer to really to ensure uh, that, that God was gonna be... Uh, listening and attentive to what they were requesting. She wanted a three-day period of fasting and prayer. Now, what is it? What is it about fasting and prayer that some ancient Jews knew and some Christians today know that is so powerful? Why did Esther consider this the best preparation before she went before the king? Think about this. She could have done anything else she could, oh, let's get a piece of paper. Okay, Mordecai, all right. Get hey Tash. Let's get together here. Let's write the pros and the cons. Let's get a bunch of people together and sit around a table and go, well, what do you think? Or what do you think? Why was it that Esther chose prayer and fasting as the number one thing when her life was on the line? That should tell us something, church. That should say, hey, there's something to be said about prayer and fasting. Yeah. Uh, this you know, Super Bowl Sunday is next Sunday. And I'm reminded of a, just a kind of a lighthearted story that the Associated Press had put in a paper about the Dallas Cowboys. They, were, uh, they wanted to take a, some time and recognize um, what they felt as the distinguished life of Billy Graham. And so they brought him on the field and they gave him a jersey. And uh, on that jersey, you know, he was excited. He got it. And his response was this. He said, well, I noticed you put my name on the back. And I noticed it has the number one. He says, you know what I think I'm going to do? I'm going to put this jersey on and I'm going to show up next Sunday to the game and see if they actually put me in. <laughs> now, Billy Graham had about as much chance of playing for the Dallas Cowboys as Esther did for being, uh, you know, going before the king unannounced and not having her life taken away. That's what was going on here and she knew that. It was, it was a very precarious situation. From a human point of view, everything was against Esther. Think about this. The law was against her because nobody was to go before the king unannounced. Then you have to figure the government was against her because if you see in chapter three, listen, listen, the decree in the king's signet had already been given. Her being a female was against her. You, you, you have to understand, uh, she was a lady and, and the king's attitude toward, towards, attitude towards women was worse than chauvinistic. You just got to read two chapters prior and see what happened to Vashti when she chose not to go before the king when he beckoned her. He banished her and said, I'm done with you. The officers were against her because really they did only the things that would brought favor with Haman. So everything was against her. But we know this, folks, if God be for us, who can be against us? And we have to remember that. So through prayer and fasting, we position ourselves where God can most possibly bless us. Now, I'm gonna show you something that God showed me as I was studying for this message that jumped off the page almost like I haven't seen in a long time. The Lord just, just gave it to me and said, man, that, you need to remember that personally for yourself. And I wanna show you the only passage you're gonna look at today is Esther and one other chapter. Matthew 15, turn there if you would, it'll be the only other verse we look at, Matthew 15. I wanna show you something about prayer. And I wanna show you something about making requests before God and going to the Lord because as you're turning there, I wanna say this. There are some people that just say, they, this is their philosophy. Listen, listen, if God's gonna, God's gonna do it or he's not gonna do it, uh, you know, how many times do I pray? And I think these are legitimate questions. How many times do I pray? Do I? Uh, I don't want to do vain repetitions. Uh, I know from a pharisaical standpoint, you have those that made long prayers. 
and they wore the long robes and they loved to be called rabbi. Matter of fact, when they would fast, their countenance would change, really letting everybody know that they were fasting. Okay, that is self-righteous. And so you got to be, there's this fine line. And so what we've done many times in, in, in Christendom and, uh, is we've went the other way. And where fasting and prayer isn't even talked about like it is here in the passage and see how, how um, not availing ourselves to it. Now, you ask God for something. And you ask him again. And maybe you ask him again. Maybe there's something on your heart. Maybe you're passionate about something. Maybe you have a, a wayward son or daughter or a marriage problem or a health issue and you go to the Lord. Or you go to the Lord again. I want to show you an interesting thing the Lord showed me yesterday in Matthew 15 that never, I never looked at it like this before. Look at verse number 22. Matthew 15, look at verse 22. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him. Now that's the Lord. She's crying unto the Lord. Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. Why was she, why was she petitioning God? Well, my daughter is grievously vexed with a what? Okay, so look up here for a minute. Here, here you have this woman, she's a Gentile, going before the Lord, asking her of something. Please, please God, intervene on my behalf. Look at verse 23. But he answered her not a what? Hey, you know what he did? He ignored her. He ignored her. He didn't respond to her. He ignored her. Well, keep reading. And his disciples came and besought him saying, send her away for she crieth after us. Verse 24. But he answered and said, this is again, he's telling her finally giving her an answer, he says, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So there, there there's a dispensational thing there. God is giving clearly, uh, not only uh, to us today to see, but for them then. He came to his own. He was sent for his own. Look at verse 23. Then came she, so she's coming again, folks. She didn't give up. Then came she and worshiped him saying, Lord, help me. So she's asking the Lord again for something. This is his response in verse 26. He answered and said, this is the second time, it's not meat to take the children's bread, okay, that's the Jews, and to cast it to the what? I love her answer. And she said, Lord, truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the master's table. He said to her in verse 28, then, then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy what? Be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Folks, what a picture. What a picture. Don't be hesitant to go to the Lord and bring your prayers and your supplications and your request to him again. And again, I'm not talking about vain repetitions. I'm not talking about Hail Marys. I'm not talking about any. I'm talking about crying out to God. Don't you remember blind Bartimaeus standing there crying out to the Lord? Crying out to the Lord. Now, when you have a situation facing you, many times, which seems that there's no human answer. I don't really know what to do. Listen, church, this is, this is the point. Prayer and fasting may be the answer. Well, Esther was about to take a stand before the king, and before she took the stand in front of the king, she was going to take a stand on her knees. How effective is prayer and fasting helping us take a stand for such a time as this? Well, I want you to look at chapter 5 here, and we're going to see the answer to the prayer and fasting. Let's look at what happened after Esther and the Jews fasted for three days before she went before the king. Look at Esther 5, look at verse 1. Now it came to pass on the third day that Esther put on the royal apparel and stood in the inner court. So here she goes, folks. She's on her way. And it goes on to say in verse number 2 after, he, after she does it, And it was so when the king saw Esther the queen standing in the court, she obtained favor in his sight. Hey, part of the prayer has already been answered. Because it says in the end of verse 2, he, the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. 
So Esther drew near and touched the top of the scepter. Folks, what a, what a, what a picture. What a picture. And there's a picture here of the, of the church and us, and I won't get into all that today, but uh, he held out the golden scepter that was in his hand. So she went forward and she touched the end of it. Now, I love verse three. Notice the response. He's tripping over his royal robe to give her whatever she wants. Look at verse three. Then said the king unto her, what wilt thou, Queen Esther? And what is thy request? It shall be given thee to half of the kingdom. What a positive response to the prayer and fasting of Esther and her friends. Not only did the king hold out the golden scepter, but he basically says to her, I'll give you to half, up to half of the kingdom. This response tells us, folks, listen, that prayer with fasting is extremely powerful. What's so great about prayer with fasting? What does it do for us? Now, this will seem comical to you, but my, my, my message, I should be right on time. I got about maybe 15 minutes left, but that was my introduction, and I, have to, I only have a two-point message. So, and the two points are very quick. So what, what's prayer and fasting? What's, what is it gonna do for us? First, prayer and fasting will increase your insight increase your, during the three days of prayer and fasting, God's, God had been giving Esther a plan. Why? She's more attentive. She's listening. She's communing. Every time you get hungry when you fast, you start thinking about why you're fasting and then you start talking to the Lord. God, hey, let me say this. God always has a plan for you. Did you, did you know God's got a plan for your life, but you don't always see it. And I don't always see it. Think about, think about that. But you know what? Sometimes through prayer and sometimes through fasting, God begins to give you that discernment that you want and that discretion that you're looking for so you can see God's will. If I were to ask this question, how many of you want to know God's will for your life? Well, everybody would say, praise God, I, I definitely do. Or you may be at a pivotal point in your life and you're not even sure what to do and you've got a big decision to make. Well, Sometimes prayer and fasting will give you that insight into making that decision. Helps you understand God's plan. The king could see Esther's confidence because she and others uh, really had been intensifying their efforts of knowing God's will. So the king asked her, what's on your mind? He, he was aroused by her curiosity. What, what's so important that you risked your life? Look at verse four, chapter five, verse four. Esther answered, if it seemed good unto the king, let, 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 let the king and Haman come this day unto the banquet that I have prepared for him. Notice the word prepared. That's one of the things prayer and fasting does. It prepares us. Verse five, look at it. Chapter five, verse five. Then the king, don't drift on me here. You gotta get this. I think it'll be a help to you. The king said, cause Haman to make haste and that he may uh, do as Esther has said. So the king and Haman came to the banquet and Esther had prepared Prayer and fasting is so powerful that really, as I mentioned, it's kind of like the, the king is tripping over his royal robes to uh, make Esther happy. You know, she gets her request. She gets her request. And he says, yes, I will go to this banquet that you're requesting. Now, here's the funny, this is comical to me. Look, verse nine, you see Haman whistling and skipping his way home. Haman is so excited. Look at verse nine, chapter five, verse nine. I, I love this. He says, then went Haman forth that day, joyful and with glad heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai on the king's gate, that he stood not up nor moved for him, he was full of indignation against Mordecai. You know what, folks? Haman had everything that you could even ever want. But one Jew that would not reverence him just stuck in his cross so bad, it bothered him so much, he goes home to his wife, kind of like Ahab the powder, goes home to his wife Zeresh, and they develop a plan to build some gallows to hang Mordecai, and they put together this sadistic plot to kill him. Haman is incredibly insecure He's a hate-filled powder. He comes home crying like a spoiled brat. Now you can expect that from a child, amen? But you don't expect that from adults. A lot of folks are like Haman. 
Uh, here's a good piece of advice. Yeah, just make sure this is not the case with you. Don't blame other people for your unhappiness. Don't blame other people. Be honest with yourself. Haman was an Agite. He hated all Jews because, because of his background. Uh, he was a racist and his attitude was wrong, but he had a special hatred for uh, Mordecai. Mordecai was an important man. He sat at the gate, sign of influence. And Haman wanted to be more important. Listen carefully. Haman wanted to be more important than Mordecai. Be careful, be careful of wanting to be more important than everyone else. Just be careful. His wife should have said, Haman, get over yourself. Get over yourself. But no, she tells him just what he wants to hear. Build a gallows. And everybody will see it, and then you'll hang Mordecai on it. You know, if anything you learn in the book of Esther, we learn that we need people that will tell us what we need to hear, not what we want to hear. Why does the Bible give us this insight into the heart and the life and the mind of Haman? Because God wants us uh, really to see others insightfully. He wants us to have insight uh, into our own thoughts and emotions. Uh, I want to make sure I'm not Haman. I want to make sure that I don't have envy and jealousy and pride and arrogancy. Prayer with fasting helps us to obtain such insights. Prayer and fasting has provided a safe audience for Esther before the king. Secondly, I told you my points were quick. Secondly, prayer and fasting reduces stress. Prayer and fasting reduces stress. Esther was living in a stress-filled environment. Uh, so are we. We live in a stress-filled environment. With today's constant media barrage of, of, of news and people feel bad enough already, they don't want anything that makes them feel worse, says anthropologist turned brand strategist Cheryl Swanson. Listen to what she says. Listen carefully to this. With all the information coming at us 24-7, we are processing information at 400 times the rate of our Renaissance uh, ancestors. Now this is a new human task, she says, that we haven't had time to adapt to yet physically or mentally. That's why even right now some of you, even though it's only the Pro Bowl today and that's the lamest game in the world, you're having a hard time focusing today. That's why I said reading a whole chapter Sunday morning, it's a story, but just not to drift. And I'll talk about it tonight, actually. I have an analogy uh, that I'm going to be using tonight. This is for tonight's uh, about giving and receiving. And, and one, my job is just to give out the information. Your job is to receive it. And when I took this out of my office, because I was going to use this for tonight's illustration, which I am, I, I started realizing the PSI on this is just <laughs> something isn't right on this. I, I, this might be Tom Brady's, but... So seriously, that's kind of how the whole thing came about, but it's a new human task. We, uh, that's why we're getting uh, tech-related health problems that were never there before, like carpal tunnel and maybe even mental and neurological problems that can be, you know, all this stuff that we're taking. We haven't even had time to fully ascertain the full effects that it's having on us yet because technology is going like that. The science hasn't even caught up with it yet. Naturally, folks, our attention span that we used to have is, is dissipating, okay? We are, we are whisked by stimuli. Just, it's kind of like your devotional time that you're reading your Bible and, you, and you're doing your devotions and you've got this shiny object that's sitting over here. It's about this big, and you're trying to spend the time with the Lord and ding, ding, tweet, tweet, whatever, boing, and it's just going off all the time. Hey, put it away. Hide it. Turn it off all the way. I know it's just, it's just kind of like, you know, I, I don't know what to do. Well, you don't understand, I do my devotions on my phone. And that's fine, but you got all kinds of things that are going to pop. You know, somebody's emailing you. You got all this stuff. Listen, we want the power of God in our lives. I just read a book, uh, yes, uh, a couple days ago I was reading a book, and the question was asked, why is it, and he asked this preacher, this preacher was 80, and, uh, excuse me, this preacher was 
40 at the time and asked a preacher who was in his 80s or 90s who ministered in 1900s, like 1905, 1910. And he said this, why is it, and this was in the, I don't know, might have been in the 50s or 60s at the time, why is it that we are not seeing the revivals like we saw with Billy Sunday and D.L. Moody that swept this country? Why is it? What happened? And, and the preacher's response was one thing. He says, we just have too much stuff. I know that isn't some deep, profound theological answer, but think it through, process that thought. Stuff, stuff clouds our ability to even get the mind of God sometimes on an issue. Stuff, things. Paul, or the writer of Hebrews, tells us, calls it weights. The weights that so easily beset us. Not sin, weights. And sometimes that phone or that iPad or that Surface or that laptop or that television or that whatever is a weight that is not allowing you to get the mind of God. And Esther, in this particular case, knew the gravity of the issue was hand and said, listen, hey, everybody pray and everybody fast for three days because something big is going down. And I think we've lost that in America. She goes on to say, with 400 times more information, did not come 400 more hours in a day. So we steal that time from sleep deliberately by working late into the night, or really undeliberately by being too wired <laughs> to go to sleep. We're too wound up. Here's a funny thing. This is funny. I sat down last night, and I, 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 I love the book of Esther. It's one of my favorite books. I read through the book of Esther last night, and, and I got to, it reminded me that the, the king in chapter 6, he couldn't sleep. I'm going to do a little Bible trivia here this morning. Who can remember in here, what did the, because the king couldn't sleep, what did he request of his servants? The Chronicles. I can't sleep. Bring me the Chronicles. <laughs> so, hey, there's a lesson. You got something. Okay. You don't know, I got my iPad, I'm on CNN, and I'm, I'm, you just find out, and ISIS is doing this, and uh, Russell Wilson just uh, had a miracle pass, and all this stuff's going on over here, and I'm reading all these stats, and, 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 and it's stimuli, right? And we're just, you want to go to sleep? Break out the book of Chronicles. <laughs> and it just inevitably, there's something to it. That's what he asked for. And... Uh, you know, really, uh, uh, hence another trend, uh, escalating sleep industry with new, uh, new pills and pillows and big hotels with sleep concierge and trying to all help us to get the disease that we need. But listen, another byproduct of trying to pack too much into the day is the erosion of dinner time. It's the erosion. This, of course, is nothing new. In the 60s, they say, or 50s, uh, dinner time statistically, as they go back, was to be maybe 40 to 45 minutes as the family sat around the dinner table and spent time together at dinner. Swanson investigators traveled the country, dropping in on real families. They found that dinner time in America has almost evaporated completely. It, you, it really, in the 90s, it went down to about 50 minutes, and now it's almost gone. Swanson says it's basically five minutes, and nobody's even sitting down anymore. You say, well, what's the big deal? I think it is a big deal. I think that's some time where you get to talk to one another. How did your day go? You get to pray together. You're missionaries. You build relationships. Now, having said that, I also am not a, a preacher that's going to stand up and say, well, you know, you ought to do this because if your work schedule does not allow you, then it's your work schedule and just pray and try to work it out to where you can be there. Schedule certain times that you can or do what you got to do. Uh, you know, what, I, I, so I'm not going to stand up here and say uh, anything in, along those lines. I think you ought to just pray. But when parents are not available, they say now that kids prepare themselves latchkey dinners. How many of you have ever heard the term latchkey kids? You've heard that term. Uh, I won't ask how many of you were latchkey kids, but, uh, but 
But you know what? Latchkey dinners. And that's just, you know, mom and dad aren't home. And uh, that's where TV dinners came into play and, and just get that thing going and sit in front of the, you know, the television, the television, whatever you want to call it. There was an article recently on stress management tips. It's recommended, this is what it recommended, everything from switching to decaf to get this, scheduling your worry time. So from 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock, that's the time I'm going to sit down and that's when I'm going to worry. But when that's done, I'm done, okay? And uh, scheduling your worry time. Now listen, I, I, I don't think everything from, you know, switch to decaf, that, could, that may be what some of you need to do. And, um, and uh, but I don't, listen, there's something even better. Something that will not only help us manage our stress, but help us conquer it. Prayer and fasting made Esther calm and even able to wait on the Lord's timing because she was following the Lord. It turned out that the, the one last day when God was gonna set the stage completely for his answer to prayer for his people was that last day. In fact, prayer and fasting is a great habit when you have a big decision to make in your life. You may be here this morning, you got a big decision to make. I, I would advise you to really get the mind of God before you make the decision. You, you might want to consider fasting, and that can just be maybe just skipping one meal and spending that time in prayer, or a day. The Bible intentionally showcases Haman's pride and anger beside Esther's cool and calm and collective demeanor. Esther's walking closely with God, so she's able to conquer stress. Haman is unstable and unwise and on the brink of a foolish disaster. You know what? That's what some of you, if you don't adhere to not my admonition, but the biblical admonition to do this, you're gonna make a foolish decision because you haven't bathed it in prayer, you haven't fasted, you haven't got the mind of God, but there's a way that seemeth right unto man. So you're gonna go ahead and do it. But you gotta read the rest of the verse. The end, therefore, the ways of death. Prayer and fasting helps you walk more closely with God. I'm done, I, I'm done. The last thing I'm gonna say is this. In Italy, for 30 years after the Borgias, often thought of as the first criminal family for their corruption and violence, this is in Italy. During that horrible time of warfare and terror and murder and bloodshed, all that stressful time, you know what they produced? They produced Leonardo da Vinci, they produced Michelangelo and the Renaissance. You're in all that turmoil and stressful time. You say, well, what's the point? Well, in Switzerland, they had 500 years of democracy and 500 years of peace. And what did they produce? The cuckoo clock. You say, well, what's your point? Sometimes, in a stressful time, if it's handled the right way, good can come out of it. And you have to keep that in mind. Prayer and fasting increases our insight. Prayer and fasting reduces stress. I don't know where you're at today. I have no idea. God knows where your heart is, where your mind is, what decisions you have to make. God knows that. But I can say this unequivocally on the authority of the word of God. Prayer is the right thing to do. And if you don't have a set time that you pray each day, hit the snooze button one last time, get alone with God, and get the mind of God. And if you have a big decision to make, then I would consider fasting before you did that. You know what the result of this whole thing was? I didn't have time to get there. But the whole result of it was that Haman ended up, for those of you who don't know the story, Haman ended up being... Um, uh, killed on, the, on his own gallows that he made. So the Jews were saved. Mordecai was elevated. And God received the glory. Because they prayed for such a time as this. You know what we need to do, folks? We need to wake up. And we need to realize the importance of prayer and the gravity of what we're dealing with in our country, in our homes, and in our church as we look for the soon return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father